Hello, everybody, and welcome back to the Feeling Scene Podcast. Here I am, Jordan Cruciola, your host, and my co-host for the day, a scintillating star in the constellation of television. You could have been enjoying her work for years up to this point. She was a writer-producer on the show Supernatural. She was the creator of the show The Magicians. She is the creator of the show You. She is a producer of the Apple TV show Physical, provoking us to obsession, to fandom, to standom for years. Sarah Gamble is there. What else do the people need to know about you before we get started? I feel like there's sort of, like, you have a long, fantastic resume, so I don't want to shortchange it, but I don't want to get too in the weeds, so what else should we start with here? Um, that was amazing. Thank you. Oh, yeah, great. You made, you made me sound really sparkly. I appreciate it. I mean, I feel like not knowing you, sparkly does seem like something that is forward from you. Like, I think of you as kind of a sparkly presence in terms of, like, media interface, mm. glamorous, the talent, obviously, we know is there. So I think sparkly is easy to come by. I didn't have to do much for that one. Oh, thank you. I consider myself glamorous from the waist up. These days, <laughs> fabulous. I mean, you know, definitely wearing yoga pants under here. Listen, in the Zoom, in the Zoom life that we have entered in this age, that's that's the only glam that matters much of the time. So, yeah. thanks for putting in that waste up effort. We truly <laughs> appreciate you. Um, and there is you is coming season four, February 9th. and mm -hmm. I, I believe that's the occasion that that brings you to the show today. You might have something else coming out eminently, or is you the top line for now? That's the top line, yeah. Okay. Can I tell you my 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 first point of of Sarah Gamble awareness was <laughs> I The Magicians is the only show I've ever had to stop watching because I got too invested. And I had to I had to draw a line and be like you're thinking about this show <laughs> far too much when you're not watching the show. It's time for you to quit. You have you have to take a step back. One day I hope to finish it, but I was I was getting too wrapped up in the lives of these fictional characters. So I was like, I gotta go. I gotta turn it off. It was simply too immersive, Sarah. Thank you. I don't. I'm not sure if I should um, feel flattered or apologize. <laughs> <laughs> no, no. It, it's really it's a me thing. My favorite character immediately became Julia, mm. and. The horrible things that happened to that character became so taxing for me. I was like, I can't go on. Congratulations to you on cre creating really solid, really buy it, high buy-in fiction, Sarah. Thank you. No, I mean, anytime somebody says something nice about pretty much anything I've been working on lately, I, I feel like I have to say, um, first of all, it's based on some pretty amazing books. Yes, magicians. yes. Um, and then also I'm part of a large large troop of writers, mm -hmm. all of whom were, I mean, Magicians was an amazing experience because um, everybody was so into it in the writer's room. It was so fun. Humanity thanks you for running a good ship for, oh. for the team. Anytime, humanity. Anytime, <laughs> humanity. Humanity will be sending a gift basket, an edible arrangement. Amazing. Um, but yes, let's, let us begin with mm -hmm. what character have you brought for us to discuss today in the realm of feeling seen? Um, I have brought you Eve from the movie Wally. -E. I can't tell you how happy I was to have someone mm. choose a robot mm. because I am a robot enthusiast. I'm a robot cinema enthusiast. And so this felt like a real, this felt like a real gift to me personally, someone bringing Eve to the table. Um, yeah, I too love a robot. Okay. I feel like for the purpose of this purpose of this conversation, we should like stipulate mm. that though the main characters in this film are robots, like also it's a love story and Eve is a girl and mm -hmm. Wally is a boy. Like, yes. I think we have to start there to be able to really have a conversation about her. Good point. Good yeah. good establishing on that, that is that is important for this context. Particularly, my default to robots is always like this is queer metaphor. This oh, for is sure. this is a girl robot. This is a boy robot. Boy meets girl in post apocalyptic garbage infested landscape that is Earth. Um, uh -huh. If you guys haven't seen Wally in a minute, we ruined Earth. The by and large corporation uh, stand in for all of capitalism over supplied us with too many things until garbage took over the world. We had to leave the world, and it is now inhabited by perhaps one single cleanup robot named Wally 
the Wally is his acronym. It is what he is. But since he seems to be the last one left, he's Wally. That's his name. It's like Kleenex. The brand is the name. And then Eva comes down. She's a survey robot. And these robots come down probably at various parts of the world throughout the centuries that we have been gone. It's been 700 years. And check to see if biological life is is possible yet again on Earth. And that is how Eva meets Wally. And then when Eve gets pulled back into the ship to report her findings, Wally simply cannot let her go. Because Wally has been alone and he has now found the love of his infinite life. And that is, those are our two robot protagonists. Ta-da! Ooh! Yeah. Right. Directive. Classified. Huh. Name? Wally. Wally. Did you mm-hmm. always relate to E? Was this like a, oh, this is my, it me, there she is on screen? That's not the first thing I thought of when I saw the film when it first came out. Mm -hmm. I was so inspired by the movie, though, when I saw it in the theater. I was like, this is the angriest animated film I've ever seen. I am so inspired. How did this get made? Mm -hmm. Like, they are pulling no punches. They are talking about their own employers with Mm -hmm. this. Mm -hmm. Um, And then a couple of days later, my good friend John, the co-creator of The Magicians, um, he called me and he was like, yeah, I saw it with his then quite young son, David. And he's like, you know, we've both been talking about how Eve is you. Really? <laughs> and, um, so he introduced the notion and then that's that really got me thinking what an honor. about all of the the things that I really related to in the film. And it's, mm-hmm. it's interesting because it's like, it is very true that when you tell a story and you put somewhat non-human characters at the center and then you imbue them with a lot of humanity, mm-hmm. it gives us that one step back mm-hmm. that enables us to infuse some of these metaphors that can be a little bit tricky. I mean, that's why it's not surprising that you see so much queer metaphor in robots because mm-hmm. it's like, it's a good place to put it where the audience will come forward a little more Mm -hmm. and lean in a little bit more. And um, in this case, I was like, wow, this is, um, this is a pretty progressive heteronormative story. (laughs) 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 I mean, she is like, she's got the bigger job. She's by the way, physically larger than him. Yes. Yes. She doesn't care about all of that feeling stuff and no. um at no point in the course of the love story that is the film uh-huh. does wally need her to you know shrink on any level yeah, um, yeah. all he wants to do is support her and <laughs> yeah and even like even when like even because initially like when because wally watches old movies a lot one mm-hmm. old movie in particular and he sees, like, he gets very attached to this notion of connection of, like, people holding hands, and he wants to hold robot hands. He holds his own robot hands, because it makes him so happy. Mm-hmm. And when he sees, like, Eve's little hand, he, he tries, like, when he starts sort of ingratiating himself to her, he tries to, like, grab her hand. She's like, Wally! And <laughs> she's like, no, directive, directive. Like, she mm-hmm. needs to accomplish her primary directive. And then even when they, they go through so much, and, like, Wally's been beat up, and she's worried about him, and he is, like, like, you've got to go. You have to. She, he's like, directive. Like, accomplish your directive. She's like, no. No, I'm not going to do it. And he mm-hmm. sends her off. He's like, no. Directive. Like, yeah. this is what's important to you. This is what you have to do. So you go do it. And I'm going to just be broken. But I'm still going to help you however I can. Yeah. I mean, not for nothing, saving all of humanity and saving Wally become one thing at the end <laughs> yeah. of the movie. Because um, their love is like correct and in alignment (laughs) and doesn't again it wasn't constructed so she had to make the choice yeah it was constructed so that what she's best at which is saving people Uh um would work for everybody on the ship and planet earth and wally who she's fallen in love with over the course of the film so when your friend is like we we're talking about how much like eve is you is that like because eve walks around with a gun because (laughs) eve is like I I'm a career woman like you can't get in my way or because she is like ultimately like the savior of humanity like what was the what was sort of the original kernel when they were like 
you know, who does Eve remind me of? Like, God, Sarah. I mean, I do think that probably it was the brusqueness. <laughs> <to start laughs> it. How quickly she turns around to shoot. Um, <laughs> uh, you know, in my case, no actual what? No, that's not true. Words are weapons, right? Um, yes, absolutely. Uh, but she's she's kind of all business, and yeah. um, uh, she is uh, unapologetically there to do what she's there to do, and doesn't really have time for other stuff. And I think that I, I think I I really can be like that. Mm-hmm. I think you know most of the relationships, especially in my adult life, they have started as work friendships in mm. some way, right? Most mm-hmm. of them, where we are working on something together, and it takes a long time for us to move beyond our creative chemistry to know more about each other personally. Mm-hmm. N- you know, most of my dearest friends now, mm-hmm. I I made that way, but it, you know, I'm I'm what the psychologists call slow to warm. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. Okay. Like, I'm, I mean, I love people. I'm just, uh, uh, you know, it just takes me a minute. Um, yeah. So yeah. So and and just like I don't know. I just I when I w- when I went back and I was watching this film again and I was sort of researching. I, I read a couple of articles and interviews with Andrew Stanton and I just am so happy that this film exists for young girls and boys mm-hmm. and non-binary kids to watch mm-hmm. because I don't think that there's enough. Um, uh, like women who care about something besides being number two on the call sheet of a dude's yeah. life, like out there yeah. for women to watch. I, in fact, I was thinking about it and I was like, usually when you see a character like this, she's the bad guy. Um, yeah, totally. You have like, to do the like, let's reevaluate Jerry Maguire later and see that like Avery was totally right to break up with Jerry. And like, actually she wasn't a horrible harpy bitch. She points were made for Avery. I mean, success and caring about the work you do in the world is Mm -hmm. a significator for Mm -hmm. the fiance that needs to be dumped in favor of the cool girl who's going to come in and just devote more of her being to propping up the dude. Mm -hmm. Um, Which is like, I mean, it's a, it's a path, but I don't think, (laughs) you know what I mean? It's a path. (laughs) But but why is it 99% of all romances that we consume, 99% of all straight romances that we consume, which is 99% of all romances, right? Absolutely. No, the devil works hard, but romantic comedies work harder, historically. This is why you exist as a show. (laughs) (laughs) I I remember when that that first season, like, was just ensorceling people. And my favorite, like, one of my favorite things that happened around it was, like, Millie Bobby Brown started watching the show. Mm -hmm. And she posted, like, immediately about, I'm getting into it, and she was like, perfect man oh my god I love Joe Joe's amazing and the comments just went nuts and they were like Millie keep watching no and just like a few days later it was a real hey guys like (laughs) sorry about that like not not act I apologize I I've learned more since I continued on but it is amazing the the trap that is effectively like I am millennial I'm I'm 37 I like the past few years like really reconsidering like looking really closely um particularly with a friend of mine we love to like sort of go back and do the deep anthropological work of looking at the movies that shaped us and Mm -hmm. looking at the like like the the negging best friend guy character that like springs from xander harris and like comes from that john hughes universe Mm -hmm. that's just like just hang around long enough to wear her down and don't worry man in the end you'll get that dream girl when she realizes there's no other option but the person who's right in front of her who's created a wedge between her and every other man in her life what Mm -hmm. a charmer that is an incredible propaganda element that I've heard you talk about before, like being being interviewed, being like, hey guys, there was a little bit of well poisoning that's happened just through like narrative conditioning for men and women in for what sure. we have been taught to like expect as romantic and sort of epic and grand coming from both sides of the equation. Like it sucks for women and it's a shitty guidebook for men. It's, yeah, completely. I was very like, leave Millie and Robbie Brown alone. She's <laughs> In a way, she's just sort of getting the joke of the show. She when was she was probably doing it. 15 at the time, 14. Like, come on. Right. We're going to, don't like, don't tell me. The internet is scolding a teenage girl. I'm shocked. <laughs> but, don't tell um, me. Uh, you know, I, I feel like uh, I certainly don't come to that show from a position of wanting to tell you, like, here's what you mm-hmm. should, here's best practices. Like, yeah, I know yeah, what's yeah. better. Yeah. It's like, I am just as susceptible to all of this stuff as anybody else. I mean, it's so, I, because I, I love romantic comedies. I love movies. I've read a billion books. And it's, you know, 
it isn't that I think we should, you know, banish those stories Mm -hmm. where really the purpose of the girl is just to be chosen. Yeah. You know, she doesn't really do anything. She's just, she smells really good to all of the supernatural creatures in the story and they all want to eat her. (laughs) Absolutely. Um, But like, I'm not, this is not me disparaging that I loved Twilight. I loved it. Mm -hmm. But when my goddaughter was old enough to read it, I was like, okay, but can we, I don't mean to be the, you know, the get off my lawn old lady in your life. But I do <laughs> want to just point out that, yeah. you know, this is a story about a girl being chosen uh-huh. and then boys saving her, which is great. We enjoy those. And like, let's also open our minds to stories where the girl does all this stuff, like does mm-hmm. all this stuff. And, you know, I mean, it's that, that particular universe of YA is a, is a fun one. Cause you can just point right to Hunger Games, you know? Yeah. yeah. And just be like, see, she barely has time for boyfriends because she's too busy <laughs> saving people. Um, but yeah, I mean, I don't know. Joe Goldberg exists because uh, we all we all got the same messages from those. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. We all got the we all got the same newsletter growing up, uh-huh. and I I think it. What I like watching those that first like however long it is like I don't know half an hour of of Wally when it's just like him on the planet and then and then <laughs> Eve shows up. It feels almost like a writing sort of set of obstructions. Like your challenge for today is like create for me a, a believable love story with robots. They don't get to talk. They Mm-mm. they are minimally verbal, but like I need to believe it because we can fall back on language if we want. But I need you guys as a room of writers to sell me on a love story between two things that cannot speak to each other. And also she can't really intimate her, like she can change her eyes a little bit. And Wally's got more expressive that expressiveness in that like Johnny five short circuit kind of way. Mm-hmm. But it, they, it builds this like sort of enduring love story onto metal objects being in proximity to each other. Wow. Eva. Eva. Oh. Eva. 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 In in as much as any verbal exchange between two characters could exist. From a writer's standpoint, mm-hmm. I wanted to hear from you about like the challenge of how they made Wally and Eve believable. I mean, the film is so virtuosic in mm-hmm. so many ways. Um, and essentially, Wally is a box with a pair of binoculars on top, and that's <laughs> it, right? With two yes. arms. And she is like an iPhone, not even. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah, completely. Um, and An iPhone that's off. Yeah, but like it, you know the the building blocks of a love story that starts with a meet cute mm-hmm. are so primal that you actually don't need words. Many a story has been told about two people, you know, meeting on a train and one of them doesn't speak English or something. Right. You know, it's like you don't actually really need that many words. Mm-hmm. You just need names, I guess. Yeah. Um, I mean, I think to to even to step back from the. Um, you know, the specifics of the relationship, which is when I feel like it kicks into that higher gear. It's like the first 15 minutes of that film is just like a garbage robot and a cockroach hanging out <laughs> on a, an, a planet that's just skyscrapers of trash. It's <laughs> yeah, like the, quite that, literally the beautiful, like glorious vista that opens the Pixar movie is just all brown yeah. and, and trash and literal trash. And this is one of the, it, it inspired me even more as a writer this time when I saw it, because it's Mm. just so ballsy. Mm -hmm. It's, and, um, but, you know, in thinking about why do you, um, again, kind of like lean in when the Mm -hmm. love story starts, it's like, although the landscape is terrifying, horrifying, Mm -hmm. dire, and and like theoretically ugly, Mm -hmm. even though he's sort of a beat up trash can robot, (laughs) (laughs) they are filming it with all of the Mm. tools and tricks that have Mm. been used on you like one billion times in love stories. The way, you know, his POV on her is a very loving, admiring POV. He's he's looking at the the details and what makes her great. And it's funny because she's like shooting stuff, (laughs) (laughs) you know, but um, it's the same, it's actually the same tools that we use on 
you, where it's like when Joe fixes the romantic gaze on the girl, what is that? And we'll, we can kind of push you into a romantic story in just a few shots. Mm -hmm. Eva. Um, what they had on this movie, I discovered, is like they um, tapped this little known cinematographer, Roger Deakins, to, <laughs> <laughs> to consult. Because as he I was watching it, I was like, big things. I don't know. Uh, you know, one of the things, it feels so grown up when mm -hmm. you watch it. I mean, for a, you know, animated film with like a lot of cartoony stuff in it. And I was yeah. asking myself why. And I started to notice how much I believed that this had been shot. Like mm -hmm. with a camera that had a an animor a vintage anamorphic lens on right, it, yeah. And I was like, "What did they do that was different?" And apparently, whatever software they had been using to frame their shots and figure out focal length, uh -huh. they rewrote a lot of it for this film. Like they brought wow. the best cinematographer cinematographer alive uh -huh. in to kind of tell them what was wrong. And they realized mm -hmm. that a lot of the the stuff with what's in focus and what isn't was a, wasn't perfect. Uh -huh. So they, um, this is why Pixar is very cool and one of a kind. Like they'll, uh -huh. they'll, they'll pause and they'll do this or they'll do this as they're going. And mm -hmm. when you watch it, you can see, um, this is also, you know, the language of cinema. This is what helps you love people mm -hmm. is this, all of this um, subliminal stuff where, right. you know, for your whole life, you've been seeing the beautiful woman mm -hmm. shot in this certain way. And one of the things that if you're not a geek about, film that you might not realize is that they're using a certain kind of lens mm -hmm. and this um and they're shooting her through this glass and it's imperfect mm -hmm. so there will be these little subliminal things that like vignette her in a beautiful way right. and if you watch wally they put flaws in the glass and this is sorry i won't be too much of a geek for too long no, but this I is think something this where is i was just fascinating like, um because we did you know it was the same thing um, when we were first making you and, uh -huh. um, Lee Tolan Krieger was shooting the first episode, the pilot and, and every, I don't know if this is still true, but a few years ago when we shot it, it's like every director wants to shoot on anamorphic lenses, okay. yes. right? Which are, um, beautiful. They are older. They, um, make things look more expensive because we, um, associate them with really expensive movies in a subliminal mm -hmm. way. Um, they're gorgeous, but they, they, you need to light them more. So they take right, longer. Okay. So when you say that to an executive, they are like the, the cash register in their head starts yeah, like yeah, yeah, beeping yeah, yeah. in an alarming way. So you have to sort of fight for it. Mm -hmm. And he showed all of these images of people falling in love in all of these movies. Wow. And he was talking about basically how they were shot. And, uh -huh. you know, this is like an animated film uh -huh. for kids, ostensibly. All of that is in quotes, obviously. Sure. Yeah. Um, and they did all the same stuff with the garbage robot. Wow. Yeah. Now, do you think about, like, because you're, I mean, showrunner, executive producer, writer, show creator, big jobs, big jobs up and, you know, gone up the ladder in the career. When you're writing at this point, like, does your writer brain just localize into like what's on the page and this, or, or are you thinking in these terms when you are writing a scene where you know it's that moment of capture for an audience? Are you thinking mm -hmm. in terms of that visual or when does that start to kick in for you? Uh, I'm usually kind of, I think pretty visually when I'm writing a script. Okay, okay. But the, the truth of writing pretty much any script that you've been hired to write on yeah, some yeah, level yeah. is that by the time you sit down to type dialogue, you've been working on it for months and yeah, yeah, you've yeah, had yeah. a thousand conversations. This is, I'm writing a pilot right now and that's even true of that, you know, although I'm, you know, theoretically I'm like one writer alone in a room mm -hmm. wearing her bathrobe and tearing her hair out, but <laughs> I've had you know, there are producers, there's the author of that book, there mm -hmm. are executives at the studio and the streamer, and everybody has chatted with me. They have all seen outlines and they've heard pitches. And mm -hmm. so, um, you know, what just how that translates, I think, is that um, the scene has lived in my head for got a it, long time. Okay. And the process of writing it is always discovery. There's always, I think, scenes are best. Um, for me, scenes are best if I manage to kind of disconnect some mm -hmm. of those voices and just let myself write the version I'm hearing mm -hmm. in my head at that moment and seeing in my head at that moment. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, that allows the weird mistakes of human communication to start to file in because you don't really want it to be perfect. You want it to mm -hmm. be mm -hmm. sort of weird and messy. But 
the the fact that it's like shootable and yeah. you can kind of imagine the space that becomes automatic i think for tv writers who have been working for a few years because mm-hmm. it only takes a couple of times of a yeah, director yeah, yeah. explaining why you wrote something impossible to shoot and you're super <laughs> embarrassed and you know people are not always nice by the way to the yeah. baby writer that i was when they're just like so here is why this scene is impossible to shoot um, yeah. unless you're James Cameron. So, <laughs> um, you know, like, here's what happens when you shoot it in the water. Whatever that is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Ooh, I should have known. I should have known, right? And so you get shamed. <laughs> <laughs> you get shamed. You learn um, powerful lessons of shame. And then, you know, the thing, and this is also why, like, whenever I talk to people who are trying to break into television or writing screenplays and they're kind of more off on their own, mm-hmm. I try to impart the truth that they need to be, like, a little bit nicer to themselves about mm-hmm. it because... Mm-hmm. A lot of what is automatic for me, it's that way because I've spent hundreds and hundreds of hours in post watching and editor. You're 10,000 hours of mastery. Right. And you only have to be in post on one single script you've written to change everything about the way you write the script. Because suddenly (laughs) the reality of the fact that the only thing that exists Uh is what got shot yeah, yeah. That day, yeah. in that moment. And those are your, that is all the Play Doh that you have. And it makes you just see the script in a completely different way. Mm-hmm. We are going to take a quick break, but we will be right back with more Sarah Gamble. Then I'll have one quick thing before I go about Infinity Pool, the new Brandon Cronenberg joint, starring the one, the only, the strange angel, the star she is. Mia Goth alongside Alexander Skarsgård. So stick around. They can be anywhere. At your office. In your car. And they are wrong. My mom says that the gray house didn't exist. But she's wrong. He just does it wrong. Someone in your life is wrong about something. Something small. Something weird. Something vitally important. Only one person has the courage to tell them just how wrong they are. You know what you did was wrong, but your daughter is a liar who eats garbage. (laughs) They call me Judge John Hodgman. Listen to me on the Judge John Hodgman podcast. If someone in your life is doing you wrong, don't just take it. Take it to court. Submit your case at MaximumFun.org slash JJHO. Hi, I'm Ketchup. And I'm Socks. And I'm ball bearings. And I'm pigeons. And I'm water towers. And I'm cardboard. Surprise, we're actually humans. Humans making a podcast about those kinds of topics. Because those are real episode topics on the podcast, secretly incredibly fascinating. That's a podcast where we take ordinary seeming things like ketchup and socks and cardboard and bring you the little known history and science and stories that make those things secretly incredibly fascinating. Secretly incredibly fascinating. The title of the podcast. Hear the back catalog anytime and hear new amazing episodes every Monday at MaximumFun.org. Welcome back to Feeling Scene. TV writer and producer Sarah Gamble is here talking with us about her personal affinity with the mission-oriented ladybot Eve from Disney and Pixar's Wally. You have worked a lot in like genre fantasy throughout your career, and mm-hmm. like really on like touch point shows for that. Like Supernatural went for infinity mm-hmm. and has uh, one of the most passionate communities following it. And Magicians was raved about and like you said, adapted from like highly regarded books. And I was at Vulture still when there was the great like Q. Elliot, how did they manage to satisfy this love story? Like, and now with you, this is a horror story in many ways. And and mm-hmm. we're talking about a science fiction animated film in Wally. Mm-hmm. And I wanted to hear from you about the connectivity points of of genre and the fantastic for you. And if that's something that extends back to like in your baby writer or upbringing life, or if that's just a way that you found to be the most fun tools Mm -hmm. to bring together these like very fundamental stories, obviously of like love and connection and relationships. So what is, what is Sarah Gamble's relationship with genre? Uh, It is the most fun, but Mm -hmm. that's just the icing. I would agree. Um, I think that my brain processes story in this way. I Mm -hmm. think 
I think in, in, um, I think in fairy tale mm. and, mm. um, you know, when I think about the ingredients that go into a story, um, they aren't actually any different mm-hmm. if you have a monster or a robot or an alien or a serial mm-hmm. killer, something really heightened, the purpose of having these heightened ingredients, part of it is because like, we all love to blow some shit up. Yeah, we want to blow up the biggest thing we can sign. afford. We want a dragon to eat somebody. We mm-hmm. like, who wouldn't want that? Come on. That's why like computers were invented so we could eat people with dragons as far as mm-hmm. I'm concerned. Mm-hmm. Completely um, agree. But they are, you know, it's like the line between what is real and, you know, what is very real and grounded and what is genre is sort of um, almost inconsequential to me. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I'll, I'll take the world and I'll follow its rules. So in mm-hmm. you, you know, there are no dragons in the sky in you. But, <laughs> um, but I'm always thinking in terms of like, what are the aspects of the characters, essentially psyche, like what's in their shadow? Mm-hmm. You know, what is this thing that they're scared of that's out there in the dark or that's inside them mm-hmm. or inside the person next to them? And, um, you know, if you get to express it by somebody literally turns into a werewolf, mm-hmm. that's a nice, clean way. Yeah. <laughs> Do you, you, don't, you don't have to have that. Um, yeah. So I think, you know, not every genre writer that you will talk to or horror writer or whatever will tell you that they're in it for the same reason, totally. um, which is why there's such a wonderful variety for us to enjoy. But for me, it's like all of this is just tools to get deeper into the messy, impossible story of being a person. Mm -hmm. And um, I'm also really not that interested in stories that let us off the hook. Mm -hmm. Um, So, you know, uh, if I get sent a lot of true crime, I'm very fortunate to get sent a lot of true crime in the wake of writing about this killer. And Mm -hmm. I am less interested in it when what it tells you is that, you know, this mother that did this terrible thing or this, this you know, person who walked into the town did this thing and, like, here's why their brain is totally different from yours so you don't have to worry about it. Yes, exactly. They're monsters. So yeah. you, person, are completely disconnected from them and don't even have to empathize with, with what would have made them the way they are or that maybe those same things are in you, too. Right, exactly. I'm much more, I'm much more compelled by characters that resemble me and people I know Mm -hmm. in almost every way Um, Mm -hmm. because I don't think that there's a huge difference between, um, you know, just the person you're standing next to on the subway and someone who would kill someone Mm -hmm. or save someone and risk their own life. Mm -hmm. I think that those are tiny incremental things. And um, uh, so, you know, the toolbox of monsters and demons and uh, aliens and all of that stuff, Mm -hmm. it's just... You know what it does? It like it it puts a thick uh, uh, like frosting of sugar mm-hmm. on it, so that nobody you know nobody wants to be preached to, yeah, and nobody wants to just come in and be told like here's how to be a good person. I don't think that's why we watch TV. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know? mm-hmm. um, so uh, because we're digging into really difficult stuff, um, I want to invite you in by promising you that I'm not here to. Um, tell you you're a terrible person. So like let's <laughs> let's call it a you know let's call it a demon. Yeah, and, and yeah. like then we'll all get closer, and then we'll all be holding hands, and we'll be in it together when we admit to ourselves that we <laughs> share some things in common. Yes, um, with yes. the bad guy in the story, right? Well, that 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 leads me. Thank you very much. That leads me, I think, cleanly into something else I was wondering too, which is that like historically, growing up for you, mm-hmm. did you find strong resonance within? heroines or or side side heroines of of genres such as like I'm I'm a horror fan that's my area of specialization Mm -hmm. and there's that phenomenal tension within horror of that walking on the edge of the blade but and you could fall on exploitation or empowerment on either side and there's like you know the wonderful intellectually rigorous process of trying to decide what that what any given work means to you but then there's also just like by the the by the numbers fact that because women are both the heroines and the victims most often within horror Mm -hmm. we are more present in front of the camera in the starring role in horror than in probably any other single genre because yes we're meant to be attacked and cut apart and we're meant to be we're meant to be pursued or meant to be prey but that also means that 
you follow the rules. We are also meant to be the ascendant one at the end who topples the topples the bad guy. And also, mm-hmm. like, throughout science fiction, like, we start, you know, Ellen Ripley and obviously Sarah Connor. You get into, like, what I consider to be the earliest genre of action films, which is, like, black exploitation films with, like, coffee and Pam Greer movies. And I'm wondering if heroines of science fiction and fantasy have always been something that have had, like, a little especially resonant ping for you, just given... The kind of cool shit. It's like, hey, guys, this is a world of fantasy. You know what could happen here? Women could be in charge because it's <laughs> fantasy. Um, I feel like you just low-key gave us a little masterclass. And <laughs> that, that everyone should go back and listen to the thing you just said again because that was really incredible. Um, I do think that, you know, I, too, am a huge, huge horror fan and a mm. horror writer in my heart. And, um, and I think that 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 most good stuff is on some level of horror movie. Mm-hmm. Uh, even Absol- if it has I the mean, trappings you, look what you've else. done with Look what you've done with romance in you. Yeah. You're like, I'm going to take every, I'm going to take this like clearing house of tropes. And it's like, it's like watching how Jordan Peele's fantastic execution of horror. Mm. It's just like, you take a joke structure, you take a build up and a point of like breaking like crescendo and relief. And then you drop down, you build back up again. Like it's comedy with a different point. It's comedy structure with a different point of view with its head tilted down instead of looking you straight in the face. Yeah. I mean, you can Google the structure for a comedy movie, for a horror movie. I mean, there's different Mm -hmm. kinds, but like you can definitely, you can Google romantic comedy Mm -hmm. and you will get a 10 point list of the beats of that story. You can also get that for a thriller. Mm-hmm. And so we just downloaded both and put them on the wall in season one <laughs> of you. And we said, we're going to do both at the same time. That's mm-hmm. what Get Out feels like to me. It feels like yeah. a horror movie and a comedy at the same exact time. Absolutely. Um, but like what you're saying that I think um, like I'm shaking my little pom-poms <laughs> about <laughs> is that, of course, um, you know, so many women see themselves in stories like this because, yes, we can say, well, it's, you know, the year 2300, so <laughs> yeah. she gets to run the show. Um, and, you know, or it's a different culture, so this thing is not so weird. And mm-hmm. I guess, um, you know, part of the thing that I have struggled with in my career is that it is, depending on the project, it is easier mm-hmm. when I'm writing, you know, Margot the Destroyer in a yeah. fantasy land. Um, and... I, but that's not the only thing I've ever tried to get on the air. Like, yeah. I, I had a pilot that I wrote right after Supernatural. I rolled mm-hmm. right into writing a couple pilots, and one of them was shot. And um, it was, you know, a very grounded kind of ensemble story that took place in a military town. And the very heart of the story was this young woman who um, was very working class. She was a waitress. She was taking care of her sister. Her mother was mentally ill. Like, she's mm-hmm. a classic working class heroine in that way. Mm -hmm. And I was naively surprised by some of the notes that I got about her, Mm -hmm. Um, you know, from executives that I really respect who are just doing their jobs or, you know, which is sometimes we're just standing on the other side of the glass watching the focus group be asked like, so what um, would you say about this girl? And they would say, well, she's a slut. Okay. Um, And... I was losing not my mind. Not in a I was yes my girl mind, kind of way honest. either. In a real, we're not keen yeah, on this like, one. Or, you know, she's a slut with a heart of gold because she is still a good person, even yeah. though she has a, you know, and she she was sleeping with one person in the pilot. They just didn't have a very deep relationship and he turned out not to be a great guy. Um, <laughs> and I was, again, like naively uh, pretty taken aback. Hmm. I thought I am, I'm old enough that mm. I thought I, I was raised and I came of age in a time where we were told it was over and we had won. There was equality yes. for women. There are equality for all these minority <clears throat> groups, right? So mm-hmm. if you're having a problem, it's your problem. Yep. Because yep. systemically, this has been addressed. Thank yep. your Got mothers. Wrap like, on that. Yeah. And um, it wasn't until very recently that the conversation s- started with the word systemic again, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and because I started making, like, if I go back and look at those, even those old episodes of Supernatural, it's like they were made on another planet. Yeah. Um, because it was, so, you know, just the, the casual way that people talk is so different oh, than it yeah, is now. The, the me, and, me and my friend so uh, Sam Weidman refer to that as uh, the cool homophobia era. Like, not necessarily <laughs> specific to homophobia, but, like, you've got to, like, it as a stand-in for how we viewed like marginalizing terms and violent words like your heroine your hero at some point in like the 2000s in that slasher movie would just have their moment of cool homophobia where it was like relatable and sexy of them to say something really shitty and phobic right none of this exactly and it wasn't it just wasn't um 
it was yes. So it was a, a different era, and then we'll we'll um, you know drink tea with our great great grand- grandchildren and <laughs> yeah. regale them with how we lived in the dark ages. But um, I just think we have not truly come along as far as we say we have when it comes yeah. to the portrayal of women. Mm-hmm. And honestly, when I got out of that pilot experience, the pilot didn't turn out great. It didn't get picked up to series. And the next, um, you know, after that, I remember having a conversation. Um, where I said, you know, whatever credit I have in the bank as a, as a person who like knows how to responsibly produce TV has proved she can run a show, you know, however attractive that makes me as somebody to hire, I want to spend that credit, just not continuing to write that particular guy as number Mm -hmm. one on the call sheet. Like, I don't want to squander all of the hard work just to give you another asshole 36-year-old straight white guy who is, um, you know, like barreling over everyone in his wake because he has a higher calling and everyone else exists just to support him. You bet. I've loved many of those. I've written a lot of them. And, uh, you know, and so (laughs) it's funny because then the next great thing that I got sent was had that guy in the center but it was you and um it was like oh the universe the monkey's paw curled it was like you know you can actually um uh you can well I always like to say you can burn him to the ground but Uh also you can you can instead of just saying no what Mm. if the answer was to talk about it so that's kind of where I am now with all of it and you know so I can both say well like you know, like, let's make a list of movies that Wally would be on where the woman doesn't have to be relegated to number two on the call sheet as soon as the guy walks into the story. Mm -hmm. Um, And, you know, without being, you know, I think the the words main character energy are kind of glib now. They're like a bit of a hashtag, but, you know, we're just, each person is a complete person. Yeah. And um, there's- You're talking crazy, Sarah You know, (laughs) and that, you know, the woman can be as complicated- Right. Mm -hmm. Um, And but, you know, the the movie we're talking about, they're they're fucking robots. (laughs) (laughs) It wouldn't be the same. You know, no. The beauty of the exercise. I think the exercise at Pixar started when they were just like, what if there was one last little robot left on Earth? Why was he left on Earth? And then, you know, there is no arguing about the fact that Wally is a love story. The beginning of the film is he says he wants to have his hand held. Mm -hmm. And then at the end, they're holding hands. (laughs) So that tells you what the movie is. But. Um, it, all it does is take some of that, um, sort of macho cinema baggage Mm -hmm. off this couple, right? They get to do their own thing. Mm -hmm. And what I, what I love about it is that what they are proposing is simply a two-hander. Yeah. Is simply a world where we don't value her with her gun arm (laughs) above Wally with his, like, um, willingness to go get smished <laughs> in sacrifice to save the right. Both are important. Yeah. Both exist because they love each other. Mm-hmm. And so by the end of it, they're just, you know what they are is just equal partners. <laughs> yeah. And it's a partnership. Um, I mean, we should probably uh, highlight the fact that this is an important lesson when you're watching heteronormative mm-hmm. stuff, which again is most stuff, yeah. right? Most like a lot of what I learned about how my romantic relationships could be. And I got married to a man in 2019. Mm -hmm. I learned from my queer friends Mm -hmm. and their relationships. Good for you. you, Good for you. Yes. I mean, thank God, right? (laughs) But it's because because if you um, start from a place of not slotting in easily to um, the paradigm, then you are forced to ask more questions Mm -hmm. about what your bespoke relationship is going to be like, right? Which is a lecture I got from a lot of gay friends when I was young. (laughs) You know, it was like, right? Um, And so that, you know, um, when I I think of it that Uh way, right? Um, It, like, I I, I don't mean to make a pity the straight girls kind of speech, (laughs) but um, in terms of- We accept you're on a learning and growing journey. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> we welcome um, you. But again, like talking about the kinds of love stories we all watch, yeah. right? Um, they are demanding certain a certain role from each person. And if, you know, uh, if you are thinking like, but I, I don't know, I think I like mostly fall in love with guys. What am I going to do? Your brain just short circuits. <laughs> if you're an Eve, your brain just short circuits yeah. because you're like, I don't understand how I could have been born into the life I have where I have, just speaking for myself, I personally have felt like I know what I want to do since I was old enough to say the words. Yeah. I've always known I was an artist mm-hmm. and I've always been a very driven 
person who wants to make her life about that. Mm. So it's easy to say, oh, this girl in the movie, she cares about her work so much, her job, mm. or money. But like, what do we say about that when it also feels like a bit of a calling? Mm. What do we say to the woman who is a surgeon, is a, right? Is a teacher, is an artist? Like these mm. things are not just jobs yeah. for us. Um, and so I, I mean, I had just been like, uh, well, okay. Then I accept maybe I'll never have what's in the movies, uh-huh. right? Yeah. Maybe I just never will. Mm. Maybe my life will never look like that, which, by the way, is quite liberating. <laughs> um, yes. It's confusing to others. They will ask really rude questions. Yeah. But yes. it is like, except, you know, there's nothing more powerful when you're young than just going, you know what? I'm just not going to do that. Yeah. I'm just not going to hit subscribe to the thing. <laughs> Course set for Earth. Ten seconds to hyper jump. Nine, no, eight, Wally. Seven, six, Wally. five, oh, no. four, Wally. three, two, one, zero. Well, goddamn, this was a perfect podcast to start my 2023 with personally, <laughs> Sarah. So thank you so much for coming on and talking to me today. I truly appreciate it. Thank you. Um, Because of you, I'm going to now go watch 55 robot movies. (laughs) You've really inspired. I I, I feel the lack of robot films in my life now. I get that. So, yeah. Yeah. Thank you. (laughs) Thank you, Sarah, for your time. Thank you so much to Sarah Gamble. Season four of Sarah's show, You will drop on Netflix on February 9th. That is a week from today if you are listening to this episode when it comes out. And now, one quick thing before I go, let me remind you, we are here to discuss for just a moment uh, the new Brandon Cronenberg film, Infinity Pool. Um, I was a I was a big fan of Antiviral when Brandon's first film, when that came out, and then uh, Possessor really, I think, kind of leveled him up in sort of a persona and perception. I, it wasn't as much my movie. It was uh, fantastic looking and elements of that visual style certainly come into Infinity Pool. I liked it. I, I, res- I respected it, but it caused like quite the fervor and I didn't quite feel myself caught up in the fervor, but I was like, ah, oh, yes. Okay. Brandon Cronenberg. Good work. Um, but Infinity Pool, uh, number three, it merges the advanced and, you know, a little pricier visual flourish of Possessor that was captivating, that was so captivating. And for me, kind of thematic elements and story elements having to do with, like, identity and entitlement and privilege and sort of celebrity and persona, those aspects of of antiviral that I loved so much, uh, those are wrapped into... Uh, infinity pool in their own way and I gotta tell you the combination of the two uh really worked for me this is this is my favorite Brandon Cronenberg film to date it is beautiful looking it is just it is a sumptuous visual experience uh, it stars Alexander Skarsgård and uh Cleopatra Coleman at the outset as a rich couple well she's rich and he's married to her couple who are at an all-inclusive resort um, that they're not really uh, supposed to leave. Guests are not meant to leave the boundaries of the resort uh, in uh, an island nation. And they are there to probably attend to a marriage that seems like it's a bit cold, a bit on the rocks. And he is a writer who is also a bit on the rocks in his career in that he's put out one book, hasn't had another one in six years. He needs to feel inspired because he might be a no-talent hack. Um, and he hasn't uh, produced anything else in his career, but he lives off his wife's money. So they're they're at this destination where they meet. Or they meet Mia Goth. They meet Mia Goth's Gabby. And she is there with her husband, who is a very rich architect. She's an L.A. actress. And the two of them come together for some sun and fun outside of the boundaries, the safe boundaries of the resort, of the creepily self-contained... Uh, at points grossly culturally appropriative 
a haven for the rich and unencumbered who come to this country to partake of its beautiful shores and isolate themselves completely from the actual place and the actual people and then leave again. So they disembark from the resort for just a, a little day of lounging on a little tucked away beach. Well, on their way back, as you might have guessed from the trailer, something terrible happens when there is a car accident and a man is killed. And to answer for his crime of vehicular manslaughter, Alexander Skarsgård is sentenced to a terrible punishment, but can get out of that for a substantial sum of money if he agrees to a ritually specific procedure that is done on this island. I Perhaps you will uh, know from the trailer what I'm talking about. Maybe you don't. You don't want to hear it, so I'm trying to avoid it. Uh, but let's say body horror ensues from there, and you have, uh, as I saw one tweet describe her, the uh, a Mia Goth-shaped devil. So yes, Satan in the form of Mia Goth a bit. Uh, and her just, if you, like me, as you know from this pod, if you, like me, got your whole life in 2022 watching Mia Goth be recognized and showcased by Ty West for the absolute star that she is in X and Pearl, if you enjoyed getting to see her devour minute after minute on screen and just ratchet up the intensity of her performances as the stories went on to levels and frequencies that are overwhelming if you don't know what's coming. Infinity Pool, my friends, will allow you to indulge in that exact same vice of watching Mia Goth go absolutely ham and ruin lives. Ruin lives. Alexander Skarsgård is a tall, stunning man, so down to be um, humiliated and degraded and punished. And he is... The, Alexander Skarsgård and Mia Goth in this movie are the meme of one girl holding another girl by the hair and forcing her to, like, drink from a, a, a container of milk. Like, that is... Mia Goth is pouring the milk, holding Alexander Skarsgård by his hair, and they are making meaningful, disturbing eye contact as she force-feeds him this beverage. And he is like, yes, please, sir, can I have some more? It is... Um, it's a wonderful time. It's, as I said, a beautiful looking movie. It is Mia, Mia, Mia from top to bottom. And you know that's what I'm going to show up for a film for. So yes, uh, go support some independent, scrappy, hard R, uh, body horror, at times psychedelic cinema from uh, our friend in the movie world, Brandon Cronenberg. Go check that out. You know, there's a, and I will say, you will probably get to see the NC-17 version that played at Sundance. You'll probably get to see that at some point on some release. I have no information to corroborate that, but it seems like they wouldn't totally keep that from the world. So go see the theatrical version now. Uh, support that movie. And then know that, like, a couple tiny surprises, a couple tiny surprises will await you when you watch the uh, unrated or NC-17, perhaps, version of Infinity Pool down the line. It can be a real... Uh, can be a real value-add experience, perhaps, for some folks. Don't worry, you're not missing much. It's just a couple frames, really, that they cut out, but they're memorable. They're memorable frames. Uh, but that's it. That's the one quick thing. It's Infinity Pool. It's, as always, as ever, it's Mia Goth. Um, and that is our show. You can follow us on Twitter at Healing Scene Pod or send us an email at HealingScene at MaximumFun.org. If you want to follow me, I'm Joe Crew on Twitter. Our theme music is by Andrew Epen. The show is produced by Marissa Flaxbart. Our senior producers are Kevin Ferguson and Laura Swisher. And this is a production of Maximum Fun. MaximumFun.org Comedy and culture. Artist owned. Audience supported.